How's it going guys? Welcome back to the workshop. I've bought myself a second Wodkin CC. I've had this for about six months and I was going to swap my original one over for this one. It's a really good condition model, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So it's been sat in the in the barn, just sort of waiting to swap the two over. I had a bit of a brainwave and I thought, why not just install the two of them side by side? So that is what I've ended up doing. I've got my original one here on the right. And I've managed to squeeze just my new one in on the left here. So that's now my dedicated cross cutting saw. And this one I leave for housing. So I'm gonna get a couple of different blades for this and set it up so I can do housings really quickly and leave it raised up and, and set for certain jobs. So there's certain jobs in the workshop where you need to cross cut stuff off to length and house it at the same time. With the two saws, that should make that really efficient. So in this video, we're gonna be having a look at the features of the Wodkin CC crosscut saw, and also spend a bit of time just going through what's involved in fitting something like this in the workshop, and all the background tasks that go along with it. So there's a lot of work that goes into setting up a joinery shop or a, a home workshop, which no one ever seems to see. They just seem to see the, the finished result and the, the videos of stuff being made in there. And there's a lot of hours in the background in setting something like this up. So I'm just gonna try and highlight that as well. Right, so going back in time, we're looking at the process of removing the old bench from the workshop and unbolting the new saw from the floor in preparation for adding that second one in. So the old bench is a fully welded construction and I'd screwed it down to the floor with some 50 mil concrete screws. And they actually came out pretty easily. It was also pretty therapeutic to finally get all them old scraps off the floor and have a good sweep up around it. So I slid that out of the way and then that gave me access to the saw. I could disassemble all the extraction and wiring from the existing saw. This extraction port looks a little bit Heath Robinson, but it works so well, I can't bring myself to change it or alter it in any way because there's literally no need. It catches all the dust that I need it to. So before I remove the saw, I just checked the dimensions. I thought it would be worthwhile for, for other people to know if they were looking at one of these saws, what dimensions that we'd got there on the saw. So it was 650 mil from sort of the base plate at the bottom to the outer of the guard. It's around 1.8 meters from the very back of the saw in the rested position to where you would have the fence for what you were cross cutting. And then from the back of the wall to the, that front handle that sits under the bench is 2,250. In about the central position in the height of the saw, the bench wants to be around 850 mil from the finished floor level. And then in terms of blade size, we're looking at around a 300 to a 450 mil blade. And with the 400 blade that I've got on here, I can cut a 120 mil thick piece of timber. You can actually fit a 100 mil wide cutter onto the arbor, which is just incredible for a crosscut saw. So a couple of features of the saw, you can tilt the head throughout about 45 degrees in each direction. So that's fairly handy. You have to be aware that the guard and the motor housing will get in the way of your fence when you're tilting it over. But it's quite a good feature for if you want to cut the ends of some jams for window or door construction, you can tilt that head over to your nine or your 15 degree sill bevel and cut them quite easily. You've got around a 20 mil thick, 150 mil long handle there to lock that head off in the right position. So it's, it's solid as a rock. The saw head also features a built-in brake. It's like a mechanical brake. And there's a similar sturdy locking mechanism on the pivot of the saw. So the whole top section of the saw will actually pivot about the base of the machine as well. I don't really use this feature and I pretty much can't use this feature now that I've set the saws up alongside each other. But my workshop didn't really allow me to anyway, so it's not something that I'm gonna miss. I'm using a half ton engine crane. I'm pretty sure this is what we use to lift it, so I'm confident it's powerful enough to do the job. But I had a bit of an issue in that the pressure relief valve was going and basically the saw was too heavy. Then I remembered that I'd resined the saw down in place and the resin was obviously sticking the saw down to the concrete. So it needed a little bit of extra persuasion in order to get it to move and break that lock or glue surface on the bottom of the saw. We've also got a new addition to the family. 
which is Mouse the Jack Russell. So she's making her debut appearance on YouTube. So while we've got the saw hoisted up, we've popped the beam scales underneath it and decided to check the weight against what the manual said. So the saw itself weighs 441 kilos, which is quite a bit lighter than what the actual Wadkin owner's manual says. We sort of came to the conclusion that the original Wadkin CC was probably made with quite a lot of cast parts, and these saws actually have mostly aluminium construction on the top of the heads and the guarding. So might, that might be the reason for the difference in the, the weight between the manual and the actual machine itself. And you can see there how the studs and the, where the resin had been pushed out by the studs and up into the hole of the casting on the saw, they glued it down to the floor. It's actually quite a good way of fixing it so it didn't move because that's locked it in place. There's no way that saw was going anywhere. Amazingly, a couple of the threaded bars actually unscrewed using a stud extractor and then I just had to cut the remaining two off at floor level. So now the studs are out of the way, we moved the old saw across to the right and sat it tight against the cupboard. Once that was out of the way, it's time to go and fetch a new one. And it had been sat in the barn for about six months, so we had to go and move a load of stuff to get at it. And someone commented in one of my recent videos saying they wanted to see the sheep, so I'd actually filmed this many, many months ago, but there's the sheep if you're interested in seeing them. We took it nice and steady with the saw on the forks because it is a little bit top heavy. There's also not a lot of room out the main entrance door to my workshop, so it's always a little bit tight to maneuver in and get the, the machines in place. Comparing the model numbers there and the test numbers, it's actually quite interesting to see that the saw that I'm installing that's much better condition is an earlier test and model number. So it's actually an older saw than the one that I currently had in the workshop and it's, in the, it's obviously had a bit harder paper round than this new one. So then to get the machine off the pallet, I couldn't use the engine crane because the legs got in the way of the pallet. So I had to use the telehandler to lift the new saw up from above, remove the pallet, and then we could get the engine crane in around the base in order to lift it up on that and wheel it in position. And there's the old man just checking up on us, make sure we're doing the job right. And there we go, we've got the two Wadkin CC stood side by side, and they look to be pretty much the identical saw to one another. There's a few slight differences. For a start, it's got the front plate that attaches to the bench front. And this just steadies the hand wheel for the raising up and down and also steadies the locking lever so it keeps it nice and in line and doesn't get bent out of place by being knocked or forced on. It's also still sporting the original roll pin at the back of the lock bar which stops it from turning past 90 degrees from when it's unlocked. So once you've unlocked the saw, it's, it holds it in like the nearly locked position. And then it's only a quarter turn in order to have the saw locked in position. Whereas the other handle, you tend to unlock it and it spins right round. So you have to do almost a full turn on the handle to get it to engage the lock. The left hand saw's still got the original Wadkin front plates on all the housings. And it's even got the original Wadkin earthing strap. So. It's just in a, it really is an untouched condition. It's, it's a beautiful bit of kit. Both the saws are sporting the original factory fitted stop mechanism. So if you only want to cut 12 inches out of cross cutting width, then you can actually set the saw up to do that. The front plate on the new saw has got the original Wadkin printed plate, whereas the old one again, not detrimental to its performance, but it's been altered at some point and someone's replaced that plate with just a plain piece of aluminium. You can also see the saw blade guard on the old saw has got a slight gap in it. So it's got a bit of tension and, and you have to sort of pinch that shut as you open and close it. Whereas the new one is absolutely perfect. It's never been bent, so it's got that perfect seated gap along the whole guard. There's also all sorts of holes and stuff drilled in the old one. Whereas the new one, like I say, has not really been messed about with too much. It's even got the original Wadkin Limited warning label about which saws to use. There is quite a nice dust extraction box on this one so I've actually kept that box and it, it seems to work quite well. So with both saws in their rough position I just reinstated the original bits from that first saw to make sure that they still fitted with the second saw alongside it and then began putting the benches back together. I thought initially it'd work quite well to have both hand wheels sort of centralised in that middle bit of the saw bench, but it left too short of a 
bench to the left of the new saw, which was going to be my cross cutting saw. So I ended up setting up the benches so that they sat originally how they had done, but using the left hand saw as the cross cutting saw, which the stop fence reference from. Had to do a little bit of adapting of that dust box to make the benches go back far enough. But all in all, it's pretty simple to get them in place. To fit the benches to the floor, I've just set up my laser along the straight line that I wanted the benches to sit in in the workshop. I measured from that line to the bench feet to get them all nice and straight and in line with one another. Again, just drilled these through and fixed them back down with the original concrete screws that I'd taken out. Not really a huge fan of impact wrenches. It's probably the only job I would use an impact wrench for is when a normal screwdriver won't drive a fixing. So now the benches are set and in a straight line. I just started with getting this saw relatively square to the bench. And then I leveled the top of the bench again using the laser. So starting from one end, I measured from the bench to the laser line and then just made sure all the way along that bench that the measurement from the line to the bench was the same. Once the bench was leveled, it was then a case of leveling the base of the saw so that as you pulled the arm out, it ran across the top of the bench in a perfectly parallel manner to the bench. Now the tricky thing with having two saws is you've got to repeat that process for the second saw to match the squareness and the levelness of the bench that you'd set up for the first saw. But in reality, it didn't actually take that long. I found a good method in using a pre-squared board, the full width of the cross cutting capacity. And I used that just to pull the saw out and check the squareness, tweaked it until it matched the board. And then once the saw was square, just packed it up and down until it ran level across the surface of the table. I then drilled into the concrete around 50 mil, uh, the 14 mil bit, and I used a 12 mil threaded rod and some Fisher 360 mortar resin to fix the saws down. Looks nice and easy on the camera, but there wasn't an awful lot of room behind them saws. And I'm not quite as slender as I used to be. Beans. The resin actually goes off incredibly quickly. It takes about 10 minutes and you can start doing the bolts up, which is great. Fingers crossed they're in the right position. Once they were bolted down, I could actually use the saws again. So it's then a good couple of weeks before I got around to finally sorting the dust extraction so that it worked properly on both machines. Again, it wasn't the easiest thing to get to, but I took the old system down and then made up a Y branch out of some 150 mil ducting and an extra blast gate and connected on the flexible extraction hoses to each machine. In my mind, this was about a 10 minute job, but it actually took a couple of hours, if not more. And it's one of them sort of frustrating things that you kind of get involved in in the workshop and then you end up going home at about 9.30 at night. That piece of exquisite CLS pattern is so that I can reach the blast gates from the saw bench or the front of the saws. And it's actually a design that works really well, despite it looking quite simple. I just attach it to the blast gate front with a small butt hinge and that allows the movement of the baton up and down and it's really easy to open and close the blast gate. This stuff's pretty handy to have a length of in the workshop. It's called Unistrut. It's just a preformed galvanized channel that you can screw to the walls and then you get little nuts that slot into the back of the channel or the inside of it. And then you can pretty much fit whatever you're installing into the workshop into that Unistrut with some form of adaptable fitting. So I'm actually using a a gripple fitting for the ducting which I used to hang some of my ducting into the ceiling because it's all that I had left that would fit that actual size of ducting so I've just fitted a single gripple fitting behind the blast gate and that was just enough to hold it as you open and close the blast gate from wobbling the ducting back and forward. And the final task which I should have done when the ducting was being made up on the bench is to foil tape it all. And that just seals all the joints from any air leaks so that you get the maximum efficiency from the dust extractor to the machine that you're using. I prefer foil tape because it gives a, a much better stick and a better seal than duct tape. The duct tape that I've got in the workshop and I used about six years ago, it tends to start peeling off in places and it looks a bit tatty, whereas the foil tape always seems to remain stuck in place. There we have it, that is the finished pair of saws. What's the collective noun for a 
a pair of Wadkin CCs. I'm pretty sure a word needs inventing for such a thing. But yeah, chuffed to bits with them. They're absolutely brilliant. The extraction, perfect. Reach it, it's nice and easy. Think to open and close them from the front of the saw. Everything's all out of the way. Get a good dust extraction through them. And yeah, I've, it's, it's been really brilliant to have one saw set up and still have the ability to do the cross cutting has uh, definitely sped up my workflow. I'm also a bit safer in the fact that if one were to have a fault or a problem, I've got the second one that can do everything that the other one can do, so I'm chuffed to bits with it. I hope you've enjoyed watching this one. It's not been too boring for people that are here just for the woodworking videos. I've had a lot of interest in these saws, so hopefully that's pacified the interest in them.